We are so thankful that you are here with us today, the first day of the week, as we have the great privilege of worshiping the God of heaven and spirit and in truth. You have made the right decision to be here. Uh, I know that I'm already so very blessed for being here from the good lesson Brother Jerry had this morning, the good comments, the good fellowship that we've enjoyed and the wonderful songs that we've sung. What a privilege it has been to remember my Lord's death today. How often we forget these things. How often we have other things that are prevalent in our minds and it ought not to be. As we learned this morning in the book of James as it pertains to what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and chapter 12 that folks if we're following after worldly things we're following after the wrong things. We better think about this. This morning we're going to ask a question. In the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18 and right around verse number 21 you have a question being asked as it pertains to the prophet. The question is, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Now let's think about that. How shall we... What's that word? No. How shall we know? Let's take that and let, let's make a lesson out of it. How shall we know that the Bible is true? How shall we know the Lord's church from all others? How shall we know the doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? How shall we know that Jehovah is the only true and living God? You see, we can look at this question and we can also branch off and we can answer a lot of questions that need to be answered. Have you ever heard someone say, oh, well, you don't need to ask questions? We do need to ask questions. Questions need to be answered. And there are so many folks in this world today that have so many questions as it pertains to religious matters. And guess what? They're getting all the wrong answers. We need to answer them with Scripture. We need to be knowledgeable enough that we can answer them reasonably and rationally. So let's study this together. Please, as always, prove me. Please make sure that everything I say is as it ought to be. I would never willingly misguide anyone, but it, I, I'm fallible. Anybody that knows me knows I'm, I'm more fallible than some, I think. I am fallible. I can make mistakes. But this word is truth. Amen. Follow along with me and prove me in everything that I say, and I believe that you'll uh, be blessed for so doing. Let's ask the question again. Deuteronomy 18. Turn there if you want, or just look on the screen here. How shall we know? The prophets were to be tested. Uh, the text says this. But the prophet which shall presume. Let me stop. Already, let's stop. What does presume mean? You know, in 2 Peter chapter 2, he speaks about presumption in verse 10. And he says that those who are presumptuous are self-willed. To be presumptuous is to presume to act when there is no authority. Well, I'll take it upon myself to do this. Jeroboam was presumptuous, wasn't he? Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13 was presumptuous just as he was in, in chapter 15. In chapter 13, he presumed to offer a sacrifice when he had no authority to do so. Nadab and Abihu were presumptuous in Leviticus chapter 10 because they presumed to take some fire from a source other than that which was prescribed. That's presumption. Think about it as it relates to someone even a little closer to home. Moses, yes, even Moses presumed in Numbers chapter 20. To strike the rock instead of speaking to it. You see, he took it upon himself to alter the commands of God and do things his way. Presumption. If any shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him. Notice how that correlates to presumption. There's no authority for him to speak this, but he spoke it anyway. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. If thou shalt say in my heart, how shall we know? Lord, how can we know if this is uh, from you or if it's from someone else? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? It's a question that needed to be asked. And it's a question that's going to be answered. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor, not uh, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. So if the prophet says, we're going to look at an example in just a moment. If the prophet says, hey, guys, don't worry about it. You're in captivity in Babylon, but guess what? It's temporary. In two years, you're going to be relieved. No, no, no. You see, that thing didn't come to pass, did it? Therefore, this guy is a liar. He that believeth and is baptized shall be 
say that's what truth says, but the other folks, the folks that like to, to tell you something else, they'll tell you, oh, you, all you have to do is believe, and then you're saved, then you can be baptized. That's not what the Bible says. You don't want to offend anyone, but that is a lie. Period. But the prophet that has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So we understand that if a thing was spoken and it did not come to pass, that was not from God, but it was from his own what? It was from this man and his own little deceitful little heart, wasn't it? Notice that some prophets were actually liars. We've said a lot of times here that there is a use of... Uh, Accommodative language in scripture at times. In other words, they were spoken of as being prophets even though that they weren't really prophets, right? Because a prophet is a mouthpiece of God. Well, some folks were false prophets, but at times they're still referred to as what? Prophets. Don't let that fool you into thinking that that's in the true sense of the word. These were actually liars. Notice that God spoke concerning the length of the captivity in Jeremiah 25, beginning in verse 11. It says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass that when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. He said, after seventy years. Notice what man's wisdom says. O Hananiah. Notice what he had to say. In Jeremiah 28, beginning in verse 1, it says that it came to pass in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azra, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, he spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest and of all the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, you know Jeconiah was spoken of as being one that would be rendered childless. Never again would his heir reign upon the throne in Jerusalem. This man is saying that within two years, oh, thus saith the Lord. He says, he appeals to the Lord for his authority, and then he speaks a lie in the name of the Lord. That's what folks do today. Well, God spoke to me in a dream, and he said, all you have to do is send me $500, and you're saved. It's a lie. Oh, the Lord spoke to me. Oh, well, I, I saw a vision, and it says, all you have to do is believe in your heart, and you'll be saved. It's a lie. Well, the Baptist church has spoken, and it says, all you have to do is accept Jesus in your heart, and you're saved. It's a lie. This was obviously not of God. Now let me ask the question. How can we know that this man was a liar? Because God had already said otherwise. And the thing that he spoke did not come to pass. You know what makes me sad? Of how many people believe false doctrines today and they take it to their graves. You know what's sad about that? Is you can't see the outcome of it, but you know the outcome. This was proven to be false because it was something of a physical nature that could be proven to be false. Now, the bad thing about these folks is they, they take it to their grave, and guess what? They wake up on the wrong side of eternity. That's a terrible thing. The Lord prayed to the Father in John chapter 17, verse 17, and he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is is true. God's Word, the New Testament, the, the, the Old Testament, the 66 books that we have, they claim to be truth. Now, are they or aren't they? We can know what has and has not been authorized. True or false? True. Colossians 3, 17, and everything you do in word or deed, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Acts 4, verse 7, to do in the name of the Lord is by his authority. Now, true or false, God has given us everything that we need to, to seek authority for and to live our entire lives. We have everything we need to know that we can worship acceptably with this word. John chapter 4, verse 48. The word which I have spoken to you, the same shall judge you in the last day. Now, 
do we have our standard of judgment? We do. How shall we know? How shall we know? Have you ever been discussing anything with anyone and, and I say, look, you can believe the Bible all you want to. That's fine. But I know it's been corrupted. I just know it's been around and man has corrupted it. It's been copied so many times and the people in authority. Have you ever heard this? The people in authority are the ones that had it recorded so it has, it has a, a skewed view of things. They've put their little things in it that they want. Have you ever heard that? I've heard it. They're wrong. It's interesting to me that that they would, they would think things in this way as it uh, can be historically proven to be the other way. But let's notice, how can we know? Let's not talk about secular things. From the Bible itself, how can we know that the Bible is true? How shall we know? How about scientific foreknowledge? You know what? This is one of my favorites. I love it when someone asks me, Eric, why do you believe what you believe. You know what? It's very rare that people ask me that. But you know what? I ask them. And then I'll tell them why I believe. Have you ever talked to an atheist? Well, I have no good reason to believe that there's a God. Well, would you like me to give you a few? Scientific foreknowledge is a pretty good reason. Let's look at a few things. The Bible teaches that the life is in the blood. In Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Leviticus 17, in the early stages of the Levitical priesthood, in the early stages of the law of Moses itself, some 3,500 years after creation, and almost uh, about that time from now, all the way back, about 3,500 years ago, they knew that the life was in the blood. You know what? I'm going to take it a step further. In Genesis 9, 4, God told them that the life was in the blood. The life is in the blood. Now, what does that have to do with? Well, let's just notice. In the past, ignorance of blood's value caused some learned men to do tragic things. For instance, if you. Scientific foreknowledge is a pretty good reason. Let's look at a few things. The Bible teaches that the life is in the blood. In Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Leviticus 17, in the early stages of the Levitical priesthood, in the early stages of the law of Moses itself, some 3,500 years after creation, and almost uh, about that time from now, all the way back, about 3,500 years ago, they knew that the life was in the blood. You know what? I'm going to take it a step further. In Genesis 9, 4, God told them that the life was in the blood. The life is in the blood. Now, what does that have to do with? Well, let's just notice. In the past, ignorance of blood's value caused some learned men to do tragic things. For instance, during the Middle Ages and even into the 19th century, doctors believed the harmful vapors entered the blood and caused sickness. For this reason, leeches were applied to victims of fever and other illnesses in an attempt to draw out blood containing these vapors. The veins and arteries located just above the elbow were opened, and the patient's uh, arms were bled to expunge the contaminated blood. George Washington died because of misplaced medical zeal. Maybe you've seen the red and white striped pole at the barber shop. In the Middle Ages, barbers did much more than cut hair. They also performed minor surgeries, uh, tooth extractions, for instance. One of their most frequent feats was bloodletting. They kept on supply, uh, uh, of, or kept on hand a supply of leeches. They would actually bleed you because they thought the, the problem was the blood. Well, God had said 3,500 years ago, and let's go even a step further. God had said right after the flood that the life was in the blood. God had said it thousands, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of years before man ever figured it out. But man's so smart. Well, it must be those bad vapors in your blood. Let's let a little blood out see if that helps. What a very good idea. Proven to be false, and God has proven to be true. The Bible teaches that the earth is spherical. In Isaiah 40, it says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told unto you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. But I thought that man thought that the world was flat. Well, some ignorant men probably did. But God has said from the time of Isaiah, some seven centuries before Christ, that the world was spherical. God's right, man's wrong. Again. Let me ask you a question. 
How did they know? Was the Hubble telescope around at that time? Was, was there satellites that could beam back images to Earth of the spherical nature of the Earth? Was it? I'm just curious. I don't think there was. I, I think that's a pretty recent invention. Well, let's ask the same question about the fact that the earth is suspended. In Job chapter 26 and verse 7 it says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Well, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the folks in ancient history thought that the world was held up by someone. That just comes to mind. Various other things. That the world was, was held up by something that can't just be suspended. But the Lord said in Job's time, who was probably a contemporary of Abraham or in that time frame, that, that the world is, is hung upon nothing. It's suspended. How did he know? Folks, are you getting this? There was no telescope. There was no satellite. There was no way of seeing the actual earth being suspended or the fact that it was spherical. How did he know? Inspiration. God knew. God told it thousands of years before man figured it out. What about fulfilled prophecies? This is some of the most powerful evidence. Jane and I were talking about that this morning. This isn't something that says, uh, well, in, in way on down the line sometime, there's going to be this guy's going to kill this other guy with a sword and it's going to do this. That's pretty vague. But we're talking about something really, really Specific. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Bible prophecies prove inspiration. In 1 Kings 13, speaking of Josiah, this is the man of God that goes to Jeroboam. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burned upon thee. 300 years before Josiah was born, that prophecy made. Notice the fulfillment, 2 Kings 23, beginning in verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was in Bethel, and the high place that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, and made both the altar and the high place that you broke down, and burnt the high place, and he stamped it into small powder, and burnt the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spread the sepulchres that were in the mount, and sent, and took the bones out of the sepulchres, and burned them upon the altar, and polluted it according to the word of the Lord. It is not possible that God's word can fail. It simply isn't possible. God has seen it as if it were now. God has seen it, and he knew assuredly this was going to happen. Therefore, he can tell his prophets, and then he can say to them, that you may know and believe me, Isaiah 43, and understand that I am he. That's why we can do the same thing today. This was documented as being written all those years ago, and we know assuredly that Josiah's prophecy came true. What about Cyrus? Thus saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all of my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Isaiah 44, 28. Cyrus called by name in the 8th century B.C. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates. And the gates shall not be shut. Isaiah 45, 1. Fulfilled in 538 B.C. Over 150 years after being called by name, Ezra chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, which he hath charged me to build him a house. The rebuilding of the temple through Cyrus, pretty specific. 150 years plus. Prophecies concerning Jesus centuries before he came into the world. Isaiah 7. Ask a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. Let's skip down. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. I'm going to go ahead and tell you something. That doesn't happen. Virgins don't conceive. That's the very nature of virginity. This one did. 
It doesn't happen every day. That's pretty specific. Fulfilled. Matthew 1. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, A virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God is with us. Joseph didn't know her sexually until after Jesus was born. Mary was a virgin. Genesis 3.15a, that Jesus would be born of woman. Well, everybody's born of woman. Well, not everybody's born of woman only. As was the case here, there was no man involved. Fulfilled. Galatians 4.4, 4. but when the fullness of time come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. Then he would be the seed of Abraham. Genesis 22.18a, in thy seed, speaking of through Isaac. Fulfilled. Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Spoken of thousands of years earlier. Fulfilled in Christ. Born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2. Fulfilled. Matthew 2.1. Then Herod kills the children. Jeremiah 31.15. Fulfilled. Matthew 2.16-18. How shall we know the true God? How can we know? Well, there's a prophet that conducted a test. 1 Kings 18. Elijah challenged Ahab to assemble the priest of Baal and the grove together to find out who the real God was in 1 Kings 18, 17 through 20. Verse 21, he asked a question. He says, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Verse 23, he issues a challenge and said that the God that answers by fire, let him be God. The prophets of Baal dressed the bull and called upon their God from morning till noon with no answer. Verses 25 and 26. Elijah mocked them, asking if their God was talking or sleeping or using the bathroom. Verse 27, that's pretty bad. These prophets began to cry aloud and cut themselves in desperation, yet no answer came. Verses 28 and 29. Notice the result. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the even sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things according to thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. And that thou hast turned their back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, Jehovah, He is God. There's only one God. Jehovah is the only God that man has ever known, Isaiah 64. For from of old men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor have the eyes seen a God besides thee. He is the creator, and there is none but him. Isaiah 43, you are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God for me, there shall be after me. I, even I am Jehovah. And besides me there is no Savior. There is no God but God. Jehovah God is the only God. There is no Allah. There, there is no Oriental mysticism. We are not gods. The Mormons are wrong. We're not going to be as God is now. The Mormons teach that as God is now, or as man was, or as God, uh, as man is, God once was. They teach that God used to be a man. That's not true. God is eternal. He is sovereign. Jehovah is the creator. Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith the Lord God, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth. And that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walk therein. There is only one God. How can we know? We have his word, and we can prove his word. Mm -hmm. Likewise, so many today create idols and accept adultery, fornication, unfaithfulness, indulgence of self, rather than denial. This is a God created in the image of man. We can know the true God by his word, which reveals his nature. It reveals his judgment. We can know assuredly that he is God. Hosea 13 verse 4. 
Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. How can we know the true church? It's distinct, isn't it? It's distinct from all others. Its creator is Christ, Matthew 16, 18. It is not of man, Daniel 2, 45. It is that rock that was cut out of the mountain with hands or without? Without hands. No man was involved. It began on Pentecost in AD 30, Acts 2. Any church started after this is not the church. It was made possible by the gospel of Jesus and the facts behind it, Acts 2, 16 through 38. It started in Jerusalem, not in England. It didn't start in Rome. It started in Jerusalem. Nowhere else. Luke 24, 47. Acts 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. That's where they were when the Holy Spirit came on them in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And they began to preach the gospel in Jerusalem. And then they spread out to the entire world. <clears throat> When folks obeyed the commandments given by the Holy Ghost, Acts 1-2, they were added to the one and only church, Acts 2-41-47. That's simple. Trust what the Lord said and do it, Mark 16-16. It's not that difficult, is it? The only way into Christ is through His gospel, Ephesians 3 and verse 6. How can we identify the true church? It is distinct in authority, isn't it? Colossians 3-17. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We look to Christ for his authority, and we only do so through his inspired word. <clears throat> it is distinct in structure. Local autonomous congregations are overseen by quali uh, qualified, willing men called elders or presbyters or shepherds or bishops. And they must meet the requirements, Titus 1 5, but there's always more than one. It is distinct and that it has only one head, Colossians 1, 18, 24. The doctrine and covenants of the Mormon church say that Joseph Smith is the head of the church. They're wrong. He might be the head of their church. That's fine. That's not Christ's church. Jesus Christ is the head of his church and there's only one head and there's only one body. There are just as many churches as there are lords, Ephesians 4. How many? One lord. This is the church that Jesus loves, Ephesians 5.23. This is the church that Jesus will save. And this is the church that Jesus washed and sanctified, Ephesians 5.26. How shall we know the doctrine of Christ? 2 John 9, whosoever uh, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. But he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. You'll have liberals tell you that the doctrine of Christ is simply the doctrine concerning Jesus. That it's just all that Jesus is the Son of God. That's all you have to believe. That's not the doctrine of Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus warned them of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then they realized that he warned them of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Now, was it the doctrine that the Pharisees were? Or was it the doctrine that the Pharisees taught? Question mark. That's a question. You know the answer, don't you? It's the doctrine that they taught. The doctrine of Christ is the doctrine that Jesus taught. Personally, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, or through his inspired men, Hebrews 2, three through, uh, 2 through 4. Either way, it's still the doctrine of Christ. Where can we go to find the doctrine of Jesus but to his own word? In Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 20, it says, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. What does it say? What do we do? How do we know that you put off Concerning the former conversation, the manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you may put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness. How's that? Know you not to whom you submit yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. How? Through obedience to the truth. Romans 6, 16. That's how. Certainly, we ought to echo the sentiments of Peter. <clears throat> The Lord tells Peter, in, in Luke 5, they're washing their nets. They're finished. They're done. You know what he tells them? Go back out. Go back out and cast your net down. Well, we've been doing it all night, Lord. But, nevertheless, at thy word. Isn't that a wonderful concept? 
The doctrine of Christ is taught by him. It involves belief, John 6, 29. It involves repentance, Acts 26, 18 and verse 20. It involves confession, Matthew 10, 32. It involves baptism, Mark 16, 16. It involves all of our actions as being regulated by his word. For worship, John 4, 24. For living, Ephesians 5, 10. For marriage and divorce, Matthew 19, 6 through 9. <clears throat> We can not only know, but we are expected to know. Luke 10, 26. Let me conclude with this thought. The American Standard in Ephesians 5, 17 says, Wherefore be ye not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is foolish to not study, to not dig, to not do your very best to understand what the Lord expects of you. Are you today going to be ignore it? Or are you going to do something about it? Are you going to ask questions? Are you going to want to study? Are you want to, going to want to discuss it? I promise you one thing. Uh, there's a bunch of folks in here who will be glad to do it with you and you're looking at one. I'll do it. Anytime. I'm happy to. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here today that have never obeyed the gospel? Friend, think about this. Those who never obey the gospel will suffer everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you are still in your sins. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. You, you've sinned. You've done something if you're of accountable age. And you can do absolutely nothing to take that sin away. Nothing. You're powerless. The only one that can do so is God. He can forgive you, but it's only one way. It's through the gospel, Romans 1, 16, 17. In order to obey the gospel, you must hear the word of God. John chapter 6, verse 29. It is a work to hear John 20, 30, and 31, he wrote all of that so that we can know, so that we can believe Christ. We have to believe. We have to repent. God's word tells us to repent. Acts 17, 30. We have to repent, turn away from our sin. We have to change our mind, change our actions. We have to confess God, uh, Christ before men. Romans 10, 10 says confession is made unto salvation. We have to be baptized for the remission of sins. Well, what's water got to do with it? What did water have to do with the blind man being healed in John 9? What did water have to do with Naaman being healed of his leprosy in 2 Kings 5? Water's got everything to do with it because God said so. You have to be baptized for the remission of sins. This is a burial in water. The old man is buried. The sins stay in the water as you come about. You are a new creature. You are forgiven of all trespasses. Folks, it really is just that simple. Colossians 2, 11 through 13. You have to remain faithful Every day of your life, living for Jesus, walking in the light of His Word. 1 John 1. Let me ask you a question. How can you walk in the light of His Word if you don't know what His Word teaches? Study it. You're going to have to. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful as we speak? Are you faithful right now? If today was your last day, for as David said regarding Absalom and his search of him, there is but one step between me and death. It's true of you too. What if today's your last day? What if this is an invitation that you hear and you spurn it and you put it off and you say, well, I'm not interested right now, but what if you die this day and you spend eternity in torment? What then? You can't come back. For those who have obeyed the gospel, we would invite you to repent of your sins if there are any that need to be repented of. To acknowledge your sin and prayer to God, he'll forgive you. If you need us to pray with you and for you, we'll do so. If you have any need whatsoever as we sing this invitation song, come forward. We'll baptize you into Christ or we'll offer prayers on your behalf. The invitation is yours. Please come out as we stand and sing. There's a fountain free is for you and